After 31 years in power, Yoeri Museveni signs a law removing the age cap to be president. What does this mean for Uganda? The Catholic Church condemns security force leaders in the Democratic Republic of Congo for shooting peaceful protesters. Over 300,000 children were born on New Year's Day, but some will not make it past their first 24 hours. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. We begin tonight in South Africa, where rescuers are searching for survivors after a deadly train crash on Thursday. At least 14 people were killed and more than 260 were injured when a passenger train collided with a truck and burst into flames. Several passenger carriages were seen derailed at the scene near Kronstadt, 200 kilometers southwest of Johannesburg. A passenger told local media the truck failed to stop at a crossing and that the driver of the truck tried to flee but was arrested. The train was traveling from the coastal city of Port Elizabeth to Johannesburg when the crash occurred. An American woman jailed for insulting former Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe is free for now. The Zimbabwean court has dropped subversion charges against Martha O'Donovan, who was accused of describing Mugabe as a selfish and sick man in a tweet that also contained a picture of Mugabe with a catheter. Uh, Donovan had faced up to 20 years in prison, but on Thursday, a magistrate released her from custody after prosecutors failed to provide a trial date, freeing her from charges, but only temporarily. According to her lawyer, O'Donovan can still be summoned back to court if the prosecution feels it has more evidence against her. O'Donovan, who has denied the allegations, worked for Magamba TV, an online channel that describes itself as Zimbabwe's leading creator of political satire. Now, the Catholic Church leaders in the Democratic Republic of Congo have blasted the government after security forces fired tear gas in churches and shot at protesters during demonstrations on New Year's Eve. Catholic groups had taken to the streets after mass to demand elections. The United Nations in Congo says seven people were shot dead by security forces during peaceful protests on December 31st. For more insight into the political situation in the DRC, Ntal Almasi, a member of the National Association of African Catholics here in the United States, he joins me live via Skype uh, from the state of Maryland. Ntal, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you. Now, uh, first, uh, help us understand uh, uh, why there is this persistent, uh, you know, demand and protest that Mr. Kabila stepped down when a date for the election has actually been set. Well, basically, um, I believe there are two things at play here. The first one is that um, probably nobody trusts that he's going to keep his word. That's the first part. Um, the second part for me is that um, both sides uh, in the political arena in the DRC doesn't, uh, don't want elections. Uh, the MP, which is, uh, you know, the presidential majority, would like to stay in power without going to, um, to the elections, only because they know Kabila would not win. And also, the opposition does not have the means, really, to go to elections. So they would like to get in power without going through elections. That, to me, uh, would be the background against which you have to look at uh, what has happened on the 31st of, uh, of December. Yes, and now the Catholic Church is a big church in the DRC of to maybe 40% of Congolese uh, Catholic members. How much influence does it have in uh, determining what happens in the future, in the near future? Well, uh, it has a, a lot of influence. Let's first of all say that uh, the actions that have been taken really uh, get into um, specifically what the, the church calls, calls its social doctrine. So, you know, the promotion of, uh, you know, social justice, the defense of uh, uh, civic, I mean, civic rights and, and political rights of citizens, all that is accepted, so they had to do what they have to do. However, you have to look at uh, what the Catholic Church has done um, all this time until now 
because what I know for sure is that um, they have been involved. And at this time, we are having this, um, what I would call, um, situation where the Catholic Church finds itself as a player in what has happened politically, something that is not working, and somehow there's a sort of damage control that's taking place here from my point of view. And that, to me, uh, makes it a little bit um, tricky when you start looking at all the alliances with the different political parties that is happening. However, you have to go back to what mm -hmm. I said earlier. The, the, the Catholics, who are the majority, I believe more than 50 percent of you know, the, the population okay. in, in the Congo, they are, they are dating that. Thanks. Oh, okay, we've got to leave it there. Antal, thank you very much. Um, Tala Lemasi uh, is a member of the National Association of African Catholics in the United States. Now, all the way to East Africa, Ethiopians are at home and abroad were gripped with excitement over reports that Prime Minister Haile Mariam Desalegn will release and pardon dissident politicians jailed on criminal charges. But what really did Prime Minister Desalegn say? For some clarity, I'm joined in the studio by VOA journalist Salem Salman. So, Everybody's been celebrating and feeling like very hopeful about developments in Ethiopia. What really happened? What did the Prime Minister say? You know, if it sounded like it, too good to be true, um, it really sounded that way when we first heard the news. All political prisoners will be released. But here's what we know so far. Haile Mariam Dasani, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, had a press conference yesterday. Um, State-owned media were allowed to come in. Three things that I want uh, our audience to know. Political prisoners wasn't used in the term when he was explaining. All wasn't used in the term he was explaining. And the time span was not really described. So if we don't know, the pardons are going to happen immediately or not. But what he said is that criminals uh, or political members or political parties and some individuals uh, will, uh, will be reviewed or there would be a process of investigation. and. After the process of investigation, they're, they're either, uh, their, their charges will be either dropped or pardoned. And so that's, that's what we know so far from the press conference that um, the prime minister had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, uh, well, okay, what's the reality uh, in Ethiopia right now in terms of uh, political prisoners? So the reality right now, um, uh, there are, you know, they have uh, an anti-terrorism law that uh, is used against uh, actual political prisoners or prisoners of conscience for um, writing stories. Journalists have been imprisoned uh, for having a dissenting political view uh, that is against the ruling party. Um, and, you know, in the past years, we've seen protest, pe peaceful protesters that have been arrested in thousands. And this is not uncommon, you know, when the prime minister was inaugurated, almost 2,000 uh, prisoners were released and pardoned. So it's not a, a revolutionary thing that the government is doing. And there's a process involved in, in which these prisoners are released. For previous pr political prisoners uh, have been released after signing a document, and there are sources even on social media saying that they are having prisoners uh, they sign a form of some sort. Uh, so there's a process involved. Mm -hmm. and so it's not like so Ethiopia is having... Free, free. Some, but also, is this something that is done sometimes around this time? It's, uh, I think New Year's... New Year's is coming, yeah. It's coming. And so, yeah, I mean, one thing I would say, uh, another thing that was uh, mentioned is uh, the closing of a very notorious prison called Makalawi. Makalawi is notorious for what human rights groups uh, and activists have been saying that uh, prisoners are held in human in human conditions. Um, there are uh, methods that are, that are used uh, to uh, interrogate people and sometimes amounting to torture. But here's the interesting thing that I, we've noticed: on Fana Broadcasting, uh, the the state-owned media yesterday, they acknowledged that the Makalai prison is going to be uh, shut down, oh. but. It says, because it's associated with the Derg regime, which is a regime that's prior to uh, the current government. All right. We'll wait and see what uh, follows this uh, confused pronouncement. Thank you very much, Salim, for Thanks, joining sir. us today. Uh, that's our um, journalist, Salim.
Solomon, the Voice of America. Now, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories you cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. Also, uh, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Still to come, alcohol consumption can damage stem cell DNA and increase the risk of developing cancer. Stay with us. White House is attacking President Trump's former chief strategist, who is quoted as saying he thought it uh, treasonous and unpatriotic for the president's eldest son and others to meet with Russians during the 2016 election. Now, the White House press secretary summed up uh, Trump's reaction after reading comments made by Steve Bannon in a new book. Curious, disgusted would probably certainly fit when you uh, make such outrageous claims and completely false claims against the president, uh, his administration, and his family. Well, Trump added more in a statement uh, saying that Steve Bannon has nothing to do with him or his presidency. Uh, Trump uh, said when he was, um, when Mr. Bannon was fired, he not only lost his job, he lost his mind. Bannon, after leaving the White House, remained a staunch Trump supporter, but has failed so far, so far in his political efforts to help insurgent Republican candidates win congressional seats to support Trump's populist agenda. Now, the White House also attempted to discredit the author of the upcoming book, Fire and Fury, Michael Wolff, saying he wrote false and misleading accounts uh, from individuals who have no access or influence with the White House. Now, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence is promising and wavering U.S. support for the people of Iran. In an interview with VOA Wednesday, Pence was critical of the previous administration for doing what he says was too little to support Iranians protesting the controversially, uh, controversial 2009 election. Observers say the current unrest is a result of long-simmering discontent with the country's repressive regime and signals its demise. Viewers, Ladis Ahok has more. The Iranian government has dispatched police and security forces to cities across the country in an effort to quell week-long riots that have killed more than 20 people. The government has blamed the protests on foreign influence, but observers say this is clearly not the case. The people in the streets are not foreigners. They are not just mercenaries. They are the average Iranian people. Iranians are protesting official corruption and years of economic mismanagement that resulted in high unemployment and declined living standards. Analysts say the use of force may deter protesters for a while, but the clerical regime will not be able to continue as before. The situation has already changed. This is the first time in 40 years that the Iranian people are facing the regime as a whole. In 2009, the struggle was within the regime between two factions. Now, that's not the case. It is the people versus the regime. So, and the regime needs to really think seriously about what it is that it's doing. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence said in an interview with VOA that people of Iran have full support of the current U.S. government. I hope and really my prayer is that the people of Iran, a, a, a youthful population, a well-educated population, understand that the United States of America and the people of this country are their natural ally. We want to see them achieve a free and democratic future. Pence criticized the previous administration for failing to express equally strong support for Iranians when they protested a controversial 2009 election. 
He also criticized the Obama administration for agreeing to a nuclear deal with Tehran. The reality is the Iran nuclear deal was so ill-founded because in part, it not only did it not uh, deny that Iran could develop a nuclear weapon, by only being a 10-year agreement, it virtually guaranteed that they would develop a nuclear weapon after that 10-year period of time. Pence said economic sanctions against Tehran have been successful and that the deal helps the Iranian government. He said the Trump administration wants to add a stipulation to the deal, allowing a return of economic sanctions if Iran ever attempts to obtain a nuclear weapon. Zlarica Hok, VOA News, Washington. What is time for our health report? And joining us now is Africa 54 Health correspondent Lino Mudu with a UNICEF report on newborn babies. Lino. The United Nations Children's Fund estimates that nearly 380,000 children were born worldwide on New Year's Day. However, the organization says that some would not make it past their first day. UNICEF says over the past two decades, the world has seen unprecedented progress in child survival. But there has been slower progress for newborns, with babies dying in the first month, accounting for 46% of all deaths among children under five. UNICEF says in 2016, an estimated 2,600 children died within the first 24 hours of their lives every day of the year. And some 2 million newborns died in the first week of life. Most of them are born in less developed regions, and they died from preventable and treatable causes such as premature birth, complications during delivery, and infections like sepsis and pneumonia. Now, researchers in the United States say people who drink hot tea daily may be less likely than others to develop glaucoma symptoms. The researchers analyzed data on a sample of more than 10,000 people in the U.S. compared to coffee, soft drink, and iced tea drinkers. Study participants who consumed a cup or more of hot caffeinated tea daily had 74% lower odds of having glaucoma. The study authors report in the British Journal of Ophthalmology. Glaucoma is the second leading cause of blindness worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. It affects an estimated 58 million people. Researchers in the United Kingdom say drinking alcohol produces a harmful chemical in the body which can lead to permanent genetic damage in the DNA of stem cells, increasing the risk of developing cancer. Working with mice in a laboratory, British scientists use chromosome analysis and DNA sequencing to examine the genetic damage caused by acetaldehyde, a harmful chemical produced when the body processes alcohol. In the study published in the journal Nature, the researchers gave diluted alcohol to mice and then analyzed the effect on the animal's DNA. Kitten Patel is a professor at the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology. He co-led the study. A, a missing part of the whole puzzle is how precisely alcohol causes damage to us. And what our research shows is that alcohol, as it's being processed by the body and converted into energy, transiently accumulates as a toxin which attacks DNA in a fundamental manner and damages the genetic information that constitutes the code of life. And this can happen at the level of a very important cell type known as the stem, stem cell. And and that's important because the stem cell is a cell that goes on to make many different types of cells and is the regenerating cell in our bodies. Patel says when healthy stem cells become faulty, they can give rise to cancerous cells. The researchers also looked at how the body tries to protect itself against damage caused by alcohol. They say the first line of defense is a group of enzymes called aldehyde dehydrogenases or ALDH. During the study, when mice lacking a critical ALDH enzyme were given alcohol, their DNA suffered four times as damage compared with mice with a properly functioning version of the enzyme. The scientists say cells also have a second line of defense in the form of a range of DNA repair systems. Most of the time, this allows them to repair and reverse different types of DNA damage. But in some instances, and in some people, particularly people from Southeast Asia, the repair systems failed, 
meaning their cells are unable to repair effectively. So in mice, when we take away the enzyme that clears the toxin, as well as this DNA repair pathway, then very small amounts of alcohol cause violent uh, um, damage to the cells that produce blood. And we sh show these in two ways. First of all, we show that the chromosomes from these blood cells are fundamentally altered. Um, and this is important because altered chromosomes or alter altered DNA is the basis of, of why uh, cells ultimately go on to age or accumulate the changes that make them cancerous. The World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer classifies alcohol as a Group 1 carcinogen. The WHO says there is convincing evidence alcohol causes cancer in humans. The researchers believe their findings offered more detail about how alcohol increases the risk of developing seven types of cancer, including common forms such as breast and bowel cancer. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lenore Ndu. Vincent, back to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Lino. And just be sure to watch Lino Mudu's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday right here on Africa 54. Now, Ugandan President Yuri Museveni has joined a growing list of African leaders who have either changed their nation's constitution or used other tactics to thwart opponents and hold on to power much longer. Museveni has signed a law that scraps, uh, scraps a 75-year age cap for presidential candidates, a move critics say will allow him to remain in power indefinitely. For some perspective on what this could mean for Uganda, Mitonali Mahdi, analyst and publisher of Black Star News, joins me live from our New York studios. Milton, uh, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you. Thank you so much. Happy New Year. Thank you. Asante Ndugo. Asante. Now, looking at this from another side, one would say uh, democracy carried the day in the Ugandan parliament. Uh, what's wrong with Mr. Museveni <laughs> signing this, this law? <laughs> I'm sorry to, 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 to laugh, but uh, I've never he heard the question posed like that before. <laughs> democracy cannot carry the day when members of parliament are bribed to vote a certain way. It doesn't matter who bribes the member of parliament. The members of parliament are bribed by private citizens or bribed by the president through state institutions. That is still illegal. So the vote itself should be null and void. If, if the president really believes that, people would have given him another chance to run again. He should have put it to a referendum. Let the people of Uganda make that decision. Okay. After all, mm -hmm. A poll, which was conducted before the so-called vote, showed that 85 percent of the population opposes the lifting of the age limit. Now that, that this is, is true democracy. Now that this is law, what options are left for those who are opposed to Mr. Museveni um, staying for as long as he wants? Well, first of all, I think people should focus on the election itself, should he decide to run. I mean, of course, this could also be a bargaining strategy on his behalf to increase his negotiating capability going forward for a possible exit in the future. But if he does decide to run, there's no evidence to indicate that he has ever won a freely contested election in Uganda. So what people opposed to life presidency should do is to go out full force and ensure that the next election is indeed free and fair. Many well, Ugandans believe Kizabesije won the last election and Museveni just forced himself back into power. What is your assessment of the opposition in Uganda? Does it have the capability to mobilize people uh, to a level that they can actually uh, oust Mr. Museveni? Yes, I believe so. I don't believe the uh, obstacle comes from the opposition. Most Ugandans believe the opposition was able to mobilize overwhelmingly and defeat him in 2016. But the issue comes post-election. What happens after the election? As you know, the election commission is handpicked by General Museveni. So they will be able to decide on any decision that he wants. And then the Supreme Court itself is also handpicked by General Museveni. What the opposition should do is go back to what the electoral observers uh, suggested. The EU election team called for electoral reforms. 
if those reforms are carried out, if there's independent election commission, I don't think that General Museveni would be able to rig another election in Uganda. So the focus should be making those uh, changes way before the elections. Absolutely. And they should start the process now. And I think they should also start cultivating relations with the armed forces. They should remind, remind the armed forces that even though they may be loyal to the president, they may love the president, they should take a message from what they saw in Zimbabwe. The Zimbabwean command and the men love Robert Mugabe, but at the end, they decided they sided with the people of Zimbabwe. Milton, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. Thank Th you so much. That is Milton Alimadi, who is the publisher of Blockstar News, join who joined us from New York. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, a look into Los Angeles' neighborhood known for its artistic vibe. We'll be right back. In South Africa, at least four people are dead after a passenger train collides with a truck in the rural Free State province. In Zimbabwe, a court frees American Martha O'Donovan for now after she was charged with subversion for allegedly describing former President Robert Mugabe as a sick man on social media. In Togo, embattled President Fornyasimbe calls for dialogue with the opposition in his New Year address that breaks months of silence. In Madagascar, the Primatology Society holds a conference on poaching and deforestation threatening lemurs on the island. Finally, Ghana's first microbrewery, 15 years in business in Accra, continues trend of beer brewing business growth across Africa. Welcome back to Africa 54, and here's what's trending. Venice Beach, California, a Los Angeles neighborhood known for its artistic and bohemian counterculture vibe. It's also known for its multitude of restaurants offering an array of menus to tantalize your taste buds. Uh, foodies can sample taste dishes on Venice Beach for a food tour, a walking tour where people can experience the highlights of the exploding dining scene in the world's famous beach community. Tour members get to taste new dishes as well as seeing how they are made and learn about the history of the restaurants. Each course is served as a different restaurant and that's what's trending. And that's our show for today. Thanks a lot for watching. Have a good night. in a minute. Woodwork is any part of a house or building that is made of wood. Crawl out of the woodwork. This expression sounds troubling. I won! I have the winning lottery ticket. <laughs> well, that's great. How much money did you win? I won $25,000. But please, don't tell anyone. You're right.